to hit play or record, and uh, I'll introduce you, and we'll uh, carry on. We're recording. All right, well, welcome, everyone. This is Shop Class for Photography 101, and... And with us today is Craig Copley. He's the Senior Product Marketing Manager. Actually, I'm the Product Marketing Manager, so we'll be editing that. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, shop class for, for Photography 101. And with us is Craig Copley. He's the Senior Product Manager for PaintShop Pro and also a very talented photographer in his own stead. So with Cra Craig, I'd like to hand that over to you, and maybe you can share with us some tips on how we can all improve our, our skills. Thank you, Evelyn. I'd, I'd be uh, I'd be happy to. So, um, anyway, well, welcome everyone to Shop Class. This is uh, exciting to be able to talk about uh, really photography and and really d drill into it and and understand more about what it takes to to make photos and 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 really ultimately how do we get off of the uh, the program modes and get into some creative things with uh, with the camera and then ultimately maybe a little bit of touch up in software. But here's the agenda for today. We're going to talk about really a lot of the fundamentals of photography. Uh, we're going to drill into that for a while. I'm going to talk about that relationship between aperture and shutter speed and ISO and some of the other things about light and depth of field and you know, photo stuff. And uh, then we'll, we'll really look at some photo examples that uh, give us a good idea of, of how those things work together and why they look the way they look. And then uh, from that, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Paint Shop and, and, and what it can do for you and how it works. But at the same time, we'll really be uh, carefully looking at um, kind of the, the, it from the photo angle. So that's the basic idea. Quick adjustments, some creative editing, kind of some advanced topics and some, some homework to, to do on your own. And then we'll talk a bit about some upcoming webinars and, and some other, other things as well. So with that, let's hop right in. So fundamentals of photography. Um, we know it's all pretty easy. You pick up the thing and you push the little button when the camera's turned on and the lens cap is off and, and, and you get a photo. But um, it's actually more difficult than that, but not much. There's, there's really, um, uh, there's just a few things to understand about photography that are really fundamental and you can and you from there can be very very creative and all cameras work effectively the same way some of them give you more control than others but um, you know the bottom line is uh, just understanding how it works gives you a lot of leeway and and you, what you can do creatively so really the best results um, come from the best source um, anybody who works with photo software and does that for a living kind of hates the idea of, of saying, well, you know, you need good software to make your photo look good. Uh, but you really don't. You, you know, the best thing that you can do is get, the, get something right out of the camera that you go, wow, that's perfect. I'm ready to post that on uh, social media or show all my friends or, or, or send that to the printer. Uh, there's a fair amount of, of, of simple corrections that you can make, and we'll talk really about simple corrections today. Uh, that we can make with software, but but really, let's we're we're approaching this from how to get the best out of the camera that we could possibly can. The best camera to use at any point is really the one that you got in your pocket or available. Um, you know, you don't have to go. Oh, I wish I had my DSLR with me because that sunset is beautiful. Just grab your iPhone and shoot the shoot the photo. I mean, whatever you've got, take it and do the best you got job you can in composing it, making it happen, and you. Um, you know, you can get some pretty interesting results in that particular way. Really, the fundamentals of this are, are very, very simple. And I'll drill into this about three different ways and different times, but aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. And those three factors underlie every camera that we have. Uh, depending on the camera you have, you have more control over setting those things. But they are, are the critical balance to make sure things work really well. So size of the opening that lets light in, that's the aperture. It's always talked about as an f-stop or an f-number, f-stop for us old film guys. Shutter speed is really the amount of time that the light is allowed onto the sensor. Um, it's, and then the ISO is the relative sensitivity of the sensor to the light. The, really the same exposure on the camera can be achieved in many different ways by varying how these numbers work together. 
and really understanding the interaction between them and why you would set one one way or another is what we're going to do today. Really, the challenge here is get off of the auto mode, the little running guy or the P or the little thing that looks like a mountain. Don't do that. Go to the other side of the dial. Find the way to make it so that you can set your own shutter speed or your own aperture. Do it with purpose and you'll enjoy the results a lot. It's really, really going to do a much better job because the camera's not sent yet. It doesn't know what you're trying to do. It doesn't know who you're trying to make the subject of the photo. It doesn't know where you're wanting the, the viewer's eye to look. And you do, and that's what you take control of. Aperture. Let's talk about that. It's really the size, again, the size of the opening that the light passes through. It's kind of a little bit funky that the larger the opening, the smaller the number, but that's the way it works. So if you've got a camera that goes to f1.4, you've got a really big hole with a lot of light that can come through it. At the other end of the spectrum, there's the smaller uh, openings that are represented by a bigger number. F22, F32, other numbers up in that range. Not a lot of cameras go above F32, but it's basically a very, very small hole at that particular point. So smaller opening, bigger number. That That's so that you know what it looks like when you're looking through the lens, but really the thing that you need to think about is depth of field. So where do you want the focus to be? How deep do you want the focus to be? Do you want the focus to be on, uh, on a very shallow area of the photo? You want a small depth of field to do that. You use a small F number for that. So if you've got an F1.4 or an F2.0 or an F2.8 and you set that down and you take a portrait, the person's going to be in focus and everything behind them is going to be out of focus. If you want a larger larger depth of field if you're doing portrait and uh, not portrait but if you're doing landscape photography and you want the whole area to be in focus you want uh, everything in the foreground out to the distant background in focus you're going to want to have the largest f number that you can possibly have so if you've got an f32 and you're shooting you know the whole yosemite valley is going to be in focus that's that's the idea small depth of field small f number large depth of field large f number you got it now, for the people who want to control that F number, the way to do it is to shoot on aperture priority mode. It's the way that you allows you to set that aperture, that F number, and then the camera takes care of everything else for you. So it's going to say, oh, to, to achieve that F number, I have to use this much time to get the right amount of light on the sensor to appropriately expose the scene. So that's it. I shoot most of the time on AV. Um, there's times when I don't, but a lot of when I'm just going around as a tourist taking pictures, I'm probably going to be on AV because I want to generally control my uh, my depth of field. So that's the the best way to do it. All right, shutter speed. Shutter speed is really the, again the amount of time that the light is allowed into the camera. And if you think about this. If you're doing something that's very, very much a fraction of a second, very, very small amount of time, you're going to get a very small snippet of, of action. You're going to be able to control very carefully what, what is coming into the camera and, and what's happening exactly at that moment. So if the car is speeding by and you shoot it at one eight thousandth of a second, you probably have that car standing still in that while it's flying by. It's not going to be blurred. It's not... It's not flying, it's stopped because of that very, very small amount of time. Slower speeds are larger fractions of a second or, or seconds. So most people's camera probably go up to about 30 seconds is the normal kind of ma maximum amount of time that it'll shoot without going to what's called bulb mode. But, um, you know, very, very small numbers of fractions all the way up to very large numbers. And you think about what you're trying to control. So if you want to stop the action, you go to the fast speed. If you want to go slower or 
really balanced in in some way you're going to kind of want to be in sort of so, some some uh, sm smaller numbers 30th of a second 60th of a second 125th of a second something like that is kind of a more of an average number if you got a tripod and you want to stop uh, you you want to have uh, blurred motion and and waterfalls that are all nice and misty. You can actually set the camera, go to a larger number, and get some very interesting blurring effects, especially in water. I'll show examples of that coming up in a little bit. So the easiest way to use this is again this shutter priority or time priority mode TV. Uh, for Canon users. Uh, select that type. You're able to say, I want to shoot at a thousandth of a second because on the soccer field I want to stop the action or a five hundredth of a second because I want to stop the action cleanly. That's, that's what you do. So there's a clear balance here between these, which is the less time you're allowing the light to come in, you need more light to be coming through the aperture. So the one-to-one -one relationship is that the, the smaller the amount of time, the bigger the opening needs to be. So that, that balance needs to be maintained to get the right exposure. Well, let's throw in the third guy in this particular uh, loop, and that is ISO. This is the overall sensitivity to light for the sensor in the camera. So, you know, back in film days, we would always go in and go, well, you know, I'm going to be shooting mostly in daylight. So, I'll get that ISO 100 because that's a, that's a good film for that. Or, you know, you know I'm, gotta, I'm gonna shoot late at night and it's gonna be kinda dark and I, I think I want that low light 1200 stuff. Uh, or, you know, well, you know, I'm getting the 200 or the 400. We all, we all would, would have those numbers, we would have that type of film around. But in effect, um, you know, it's, it's gotten a lot simpler. Your camera, will do that automatically for you. It'll, autom or it'll let you select it automatically. You don't have to change film. There's no, no concern about that. So it's basically, you set the number. So what's the right way to set the number? Generally, you want to use the lowest number possible. Why? The lowest number is going to give you the best density in the digital negative, if you will. You get, the, you get less digital noise. You get less green to the film, just like just uh, grain in film, the digital noise is the, is the grain that we get in the digital world. So smaller number is better. But of course, looking at the balance between the other parts of this story, when you're thinking about the size of the aperture and the time you want to be able to shoot in lots of lighting conditions, you're not going to be able to get those numbers to work appropriately and get the right get the right shot. So that's going to push your app your your ISO up. So if you're shooting in low light conditions and you don't want to have blurry people, you're probably going to have to go up to 800 ISO or, or 1600 ISO or 3200 ISO or, or on the nicer cameras they 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 go up much 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 higher than that. Um, every uh, every one of these, uh, these, these, these decisions um, is kind of all around how far do you have to go to hit the objective of having the right depth of field and the right amount of light coming in. It's just a three-way balance. I'll get into that mathematically in a, in, a, in a moment here, but just to show you an example without actually building out the whole chart on this. So anyway, settings on your camera. You've got a time priority setting. It allows the camera to set the aperture for the shot. Aperture priority will let the, will uh, allow the camera to set the time for the shot. So those balance back and forth. I say you need to control the ISO. Ultimately, there is a uh, there is an automatic ISO setting that you can have, and it will then allow the camera to decide. Well, I think you need to be at 800 ISO to make this, or 400 ISO, or whatever. If you take the control of it and you just watch to make sure your time and, and uh, time is appropriate or your aperture is appropriate, that's that's generally what you need to do. Um, manual basically means you're in control of everything. The meter will tell you how far it thinks you're off on that particular shot, but manual mode means you control. TV, AV is much easier, especially until you get a real good hang on this sort of thing. So let's uh, let's talk about that balance. So really that metered setting, it's always going to try to get to that middle point, that that whatever it thinks is the the perfect exposure for the for this shot. And um, you know, you basically uh, 
are, are going to be able to control the factors that go into um, the formula. If you've got ISO set at a certain number, it's pretty simple what happens between uh, aperture and time. As I go up a standard f-stop in aperture, I need uh, to go longer in the amount of time. And really the way the scale is set up uh, on the full f-stop scale or on the full time scale, every increment is doubling or halving the light depending on which way you're going. So 5.6 to f8 is doubling the amount of light. f8 to f11, doubling the amount of light, so on. Uh, going from, from 60th of a second to a 30th of a second is obviously half the light. Going from 60th to 125th of a second on, uh, is, is doubling the light, and so on. Same thing on the ISO scale. 100, 200, 400, it's doubling the light. Um, so basically at any point you can, you can modify two of those factors. So why would we bother? Why, why do we care about this? It really comes down to this, that if you want to control the depth of field, uh, you're, you're going to get, you're going to be playing with the f-stop to do that. You're going to shoot on AV. You're going to let the time go up, but if the time, uh, or sorry, the time go up and down by the camera, but if the time gets out of balance, then you're going to want to adjust the ISO to make sure that, you're, that it works. There'll be cases where you're shooting in a very short depth of field, uh, which will cause the camera at certain ISOs to b basically not be able to take, you know, a small or a quick enough shot. So you'll have to bring the ISO down and vice versa. So most of the time you have to push the ISO up because you're, you're, you're setting the ISO down. Anyway, slower speed, more blur, more control over the action aspect. That's the TV bit. And then uh, ultimately control your ISO as kind of keep it as low as you possibly can. That's the balance. All right, a couple of rules of thumb. Shutter speed. Handheld shooting, really no less than the focal length, sorry, focal distance of the lens uh, set as a time fraction. Better said, 50 millimeters, uh, you're shooting at 50 millimeters at the moment, you're going to choose something greater than, than, than 1 50th of a second, like 1 60th of a second or faster. 300 millimeter lens, choose 1 300th of a, of a second or faster. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get more motion in, uh, in, in the shot. I've, I've actually talked to folks on the soccer field saying, I don't know, this isn't a very good lens. It's got that blurry thing going. And it's like I'm looking at it, and they're shooting at a 30th of a second at 300 millimeters, and everything is bl blurry or fuzzy because there's motion there. So anyway, if they go faster, they're going to get a cleaner, crisper shot. Um, aperture. Really use it to control the depth of field. Remember that approximately from the focal point that the camera picks, if you're letting the camera focus for you, which is a good idea, um, about one-third of the distance in front of that focal point is going to be in focus, and about two-thirds behind is going to be in focus. So it's kind of a little bit odd there. Um, at, at a very small uh, f-stop, I'm sorry, at, at a very small number of f-stop, which means a very small depth of field, a lot of times if you get the person's eyes in focus, shooting really close to them, the tip of their nose may be out of focus and their ear might be out of focus. That might be the way it works, about one-third in front and about two-thirds behind. Um, and by the way, I try to always watch for that, having a lot of people's noses out of focus. Um, you try to, try to adjust appropriately so that that doesn't happen. Really experiment and adjust to get a natural feel for it. When, you're, when you feel like you, you got it and you can control it, then that, that next wedding that you attend and you, you, you get in and take that great shot of that bride, that, that's, that's the way to do it. You get that, that very, very clean focus there. Bokeh, fantastic effect. Anything that's in light field behind the, the focal point of the camera and you just go ahead and have that thrown out of focus, it's going to go from a, a dot of light to a bulb of light to a blob of light. And it's a, it's a very cool effect. Let's look at that in a couple minutes here. Um, again, net on it is control the aperture, control the depth of field, and uh, you're going to like what you get out of it. One other rule here, the length of the lens. For those of us who happen to have uh, something more than, a, than an iPhone or a fixed length lens for the camera, 
why would you, when you can get the same shot with a longer lens or a wider lens, why would you choose one or the other if you have them at your, at your disposal? Um, a wider lens, oops, sorry, wider lens is actually going to uh, add depth to the scene where a longer lens is going to flatten the scene out. So interesting point. Famous area of uh, San Francisco, I think the places that's on Steiner Street normally thought of as the full house houses. I have shots that I've taken of it with a 300 millimeter lens from kind of a, the top of the hill. And the, the city looks like it's about a block away behind it. And, and then I have another set of shots that I've taken with a, probably about a 20 millimeter lens. And I was fairly close and the framing of the buildings are about the same but San Francisco looks like it's miles away. So it's a natural sort of thing. If you have that, if you have that, um, the, the lenses available to you that are, are broader, wider, and longer, you can actually play with that to get the feel for what you're trying to do in the scene. So do you, you want the background up close or do you want to minimize it? Um, you, can, you can choose by doing that. So with that, let's hop over and do a quick demo. I'm going to hop into Paint Shop here. Initially, I'm just going to use Paint Shop uh, Pro X4 as a as a viewer to glance through some uh, some photos, and we're actually going to use this uh, little info panel right over here. Info panel will actually tell us about the shot, and it's going to give us some details. I was giving a demo one time, and a person raised their hand and said, "Well, what is that gobbledygook over there anyway? And can I just hide that? Because I don't I don't know what that stuff is." Well, yes, you can hide it. Just hit the little I key over here and it'll go away. But let's drill into it a little bit further. Notice that ISO is right there. Notice this thing that looks like a time, 1 hundredth of a second, very fast. And then F5.6, that's, um, that's the, this, the, the um, uh, aperture that we were talking about. Let's look at the relationship of these and look at some, ex some specific examples. So not a particularly interesting flower, but a flower. And uh, we have a 5.6, which means it's probably a fairly small depth of field. I'm shooting it with a very long lens uh, as well, this 300 millimeter thing. So there's this green foliage on the back side. That foliage is actually looks like it's really close because of the long lens, but also it's all out of focus. And that really puts the viewer's eye right on the flower and all of that is just greenery. It's not something that's in tight focus and something that the user is going to care about. That's the depth of field idea. You can actually see this petal right here is beginning to be out of focus at the, at the bottom of the, of the flower. Here's a, another example of the same sort of thing. Taking of this picture, I'm at 5.6 and um, you notice that the leaf over here is out of focus, that the other details in the background are all out of focus, and you're just looking at the flower. In a similarly, similarly uh, framed shot, but instead of at f5.6, I'm shooting at f32, you'll notice that this leaf is now clearly in focus. This other leaf, is there's all of the details in the background are clearly there. You can see them because uh, of that depth of field. So my depth of field went from a few inches to now probably 10 or 12 inches, even though I'm shooting fairly close in on this flower. That detail I was talking about with aperture priority, there it is. It's listed over here in the exposure program that the camera is using. If I look difference here, I set this to 5.6. The camera said, well, to achieve that shot, I'm going to have to shoot at 1 2,000th of a second. I made one change to f32. The camera said, got it. Uh, I think that's a 1 60th of a second, and there you are. And the relationship between those two numbers, even though I went up so many f-stops and the time came down so far, it's the same amount of light that's coming back to the sensor. So you can see relatively the same exposure on the flower, but a very different, um, a, a very different uh, amount of time that it took. So that's, that's the concept I'm talking about here. Take control over that depth of field. So here's another example of it. Not a great example, but it will show exactly what, what we're talking about. Again, 5.6, 
200 millimeters, same lens that you just saw shot with over here on the flowers before. This tree is actually in focus. The branches on the front of the tree are out of focus. Most of this feather-like thing that's growing up into the tree is in focus, but the building behind is not in focus. The building behind is probably about 60 feet away. So you can see again that flattening that I was talking about of the scene. If I was doing the same framing on this with a 50 millimeter lens, that tree, that, that building would be farther away in the view uh, that, that we have here. So let's switch to this other view. Now we've got 5, 6 on this one. I'm going to switch to this one. Notice F22. Notice that building is almost perfectly in focus now. Notice all of the tree is in focus. Notice as well that that feather thing is all in focus. I didn't reframe it. I didn't change the number of, you know, the, the millimeters. I, I, I just changed the camera and reshot, and that's the difference I got. Another important difference that you'll see here, the depth of field actually has increased so much that you now see specks of stuff. And this stuff is actually in the lens on the camera, needs to be cleaned. You see in this one that the depth of field is such that that's just a blurry little dot. So it's an interesting thing that, that you can increase with going to F22 or F32. You can increase the depth of field so much that you actually start to see things that are very, very near the camera, even though the focus is you know, 25 feet away uh, from, where, from where you're at. So a couple other quick examples, and then we'll move on. Um, here's a shot of a plant, a uh, nice solid white background behind the plant. You've got the leaves in our focus right in here. You can see the foreground is out of focus. So let's see. F5.6, 2,500th of a second, very, very tight depth of field, probably, again, a couple of inches in the middle of the plant. Everything else is out of focus behind. As I increase the shutter speed, sorry, as I increase the aperture, so that was f8, now I'm at f11, now I'm f16, here's 22, here's f32. Lo and behold, I find out that the background actually isn't a white background. It's a chair with slots of green stuff showing through it, and that um, the plant is now in focus, but I've now got that chair in focus as well. So this is an interesting way. This is a, like sort of that bokeh effect I was talking about with lights, where this, you, you can now that you know that there's slots there, you can actually kind of see them in a couple of areas, but here they're definitely there. So sometimes it's a cheap way of blurring out things in the background and getting rid of them just by setting that depth of field so tight that, that they go away. Interesting idea about controlling this stuff. All right, a couple more examples. Here's Boca. Simple idea. 50 millimeter lens, f1.4. I focused on the, the small light bulb in front of me and everything behind went to nice big blobs of color. This is just a a street scene where there were some lights hanging for some trees. I looked and I thought, hmm, interesting. I bet I can, can blow those out in the background and get an interesting effect. Fabulous effect. You can do this on Christmas trees. You can do this on, uh, on street scenes. You can do it on any case where you've got lights that are in the background. And uh, it's actually quite festive and quite uh, interesting to throw into some portraiture. Here's another example of that idea of throwing a background so out of focus that it becomes basically something that it isn't. There's actually a tree behind me and a park, or behind this piece of art, there's a tree back there and there's a parking lot. And this is like a car back here and there's other stuff back over in that particular area. But it's so out of focus that you actually, you know, it's not distracting from the scene. Again, concept of controlling that depth of field is fantastic in this case. Um, another thing that becomes artistic where you're actually throwing the, the field of view, uh, field of focus in here and then letting this come out of focus and over the other parts of it go out of focus. And again, being able to control that gives you a, a pretty interesting uh, artistic view, again, of something that's just a, a, a pattern uh, and you can get to do some interesting things with it. So let's talk about speed, shutter speed. Um, shutter speed is fascinating. Um, I'll start with nighttime. 
uh, if you use a very, very long shutter, you can actually see things that your eye cannot see. Uh, this is the Yosemite Valley uh, at night. And to my eye, I could actually see that star that's sitting up over here. And I could actually see the outline of the, of the mountains ahead of me here. Half Dome is this thing in the distance right over here. This uh, waterfall over here, but, but not visible. I couldn't see any of it. It was so, 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 so dark. But by just simply setting the camera on a tripod, setting it up to get, and get a, getting a meter reading, and going, okay, shoot it. This field of stars came out. The, the actual texture in the rock came out. And I'm able to see, basically, with my camera, what I can't see with my eye. You see, this is a 25-second shot. Um, oddly, I was back on aperture priority mode. I wasn't controlling the time. I let the camera control the time. But I, I went to the largest opening I had on this particular lens, and which was 2.8. And then I pointed it, and I gave it. I just focused on infinity because it was so dark. I, there was nothing that the camera could focus on. Hit the button, let the camera sit there, and, uh, and do its shot. Uh, and 25 seconds later, this is what I got. So fascinating stuff to, to, to try at night with, with long, long, long exposures. Again, back to those rules of thumb. If you're going to go over that, you know, to that 15th of a second or 10th of a second or one second shot, you got to have stability for the camera. But pretty cool stuff that you can come out of it. Um, second thing on time, and again, this is, this is um, a different area, but this is... Um, talking about uh, basically uh, fireworks and fireworks are fascinating things to shoot uh, and you can do a lot with them uh, you can come up with uh, some amazing amazing uh, things but if you think about the the time domain for a firework they're really points of light they're little they're explosion and there's little bursts of stuff that come out and if you shoot very very quickly if you shoot at uh, five hundredth of a second or a thousandth of a second or one twenty fifth of a second you may just get dots and, and that's fine dots are kind of cool I actually like these things which are the, the falling kind of showery areas the stuff like this which which doesn't actually happen when you're watching it you're just watching the kind of drifting of the white light in, in the in the uh, in the air but when you go to something like four seconds and I shoot fireworks generally between two and eight seconds I get my best results uh, you set it up you set the, the you know set the focus where you think it's got to be uh, to, to focus on the actual uh, firework go to manual focus so the camera is not trying to refocus and then just have a, a remote release on the shutter and just ha hammer away as you see the stuff going I usually um, Time, kind of get a timing down so when you hear the, the firework being shot off you get it up into the sky you shoot it again four seconds works pretty well here's another example at four seconds here's another example at five seconds in this particular case but you get some pretty beautiful stuff um, on fireworks the other thing you can do is stop motion so um, this is a, a, a fairly dark scene you can see I'm shooting an ISO 1600 to allow me to get to a 500th of a second so that I can actually stop the string in, in motion here. As you're watching this uh, young gentleman working this yo-yo, he's definitely moving back and forth and there's a spinning and it's constant motion. But as you monitor what's going on with the string through the shot, there's a lot of times where the string is it looks tangled, the string has, is, has gone limp, it's got curves and S movements in it, and it's just very interesting to watch as, as he's doing this. This guy has actually uh, thrown this up in the air. It goes up and it comes down, and I ha and he's watching it while it does that, and I have been able to freeze this spinning thing directly in front of him. He's looking directly into it. Um, again, all done because we're shooting at 1 640th of a second at this particular point, but um, the constant motion that was in the scene has now been frozen to get a very different effect. Again, the concept of controlling the shutter, the, the amount of time, the shutter speed, versus the actual aperture giving that depth of field. All right, here's an example of water. 
um, and and we could do lots of examples of water and waterfalls, other sorts of movement. But let's just take two quick examples here: a fountain, and uh, water is blowing up into the air. You know, so we've got a one fiftieth of a second shot here, and you see that the the water is actually just I know, big chunks of water being thrown up in the air. I move over to 1.3 seconds on the exact same framing, the exact same position, and now I have this flow of water. It's all done just because of that change. I changed it in this case to a aperture priority. That's always my preference. F22. This was F2.8, and the water. It feels like I'm in a completely different place with a completely different result. Just taking that control is what I'm talking about. Here's an ocean scene. Here's uh, 1 1250th of a second, fairly fast shot. And here's water splashing up on this rock and splashing up over here. And, um, you know, it's interesting. It's beautiful in its own way. If that's what you're going for, that's fine. I tend to happen like this sort of thing a lot more. Now, this is a little bit li different lighting condition. I'm actually just, I turned the tripod from pointing directly west to going south. But I also um, went to F22 and I uh, actually put a filter on to, to slow the shutter down that much more. It's called a neutral density filter. We won't go into that today, but if you're interested, that's, that's a fun thing to play with. F, uh, F22 in this particular case gave me a 15 second shot and what you get is this misty sort of thing. The, uh, the, the waves are crashing against uh, the shore, they're moving, they're popping over the rocks, but it becomes misty because of the long, long, long shutter. So that, brings me to ISO. ISO is an interesting one. Here's 1600 ISO. Um, here's a, another shot at 1600 ISO. Um, I'm able to shoot it handheld, um, 1 60th of a second, f2.8. Uh, but if we look at this and we zoom in a bit, you'll see that there's noise. And I don't know if you can see this on the go to meeting, uh, but there's this field of little, little sandy stuff in the background. That's what happens when you go up in ISO, and you got to be careful about that. So really, you know, fundamentally, uh, you, you get shot because you can go to the high ISO. You're going to probably have to do some post-processing to figure out how to, how to um, you know, get rid of that if you're going to be doing anything outside of a, uh, you know, if you're going to try to print it as an example. Um, here's just a different example. This is a one-second shot, shot at ISO 100. Uh, you got the got that motion that's going on there. Uh, it's actually really, really dark uh, at this particular point, uh, relatively. I mean, the sky has got light on it, and uh, what you can see is in the rocks that uh, there is noise, but nowhere near as much noise as there is in in uh, this background. Um, and again, I apologize because it's probably not coming through on the go to meeting, but um, the, this looks like sand on my screen. Uh, in the background versus the uh, the other uh, other images which don't have that uh, per se. So um, with that, uh, let me just talk about a couple of things uh, really quickly uh, with um, with the adjustments that we have available to us in Paint Shop. And um, I'll, I'll say this that. Most of what I'm going to show you is available in X3, so if you're not an X4 user, um, you can still do this sort of stuff. Uh, and uh, I, will I will say that, the, that this particular mode that I've just gone into in X4 has been refactored and has been uh, modified such that um, it's a, a little bit simpler and cleaner to use. So this is called um, Express, uh, sorry, uh, Express Lab in uh, X3. This is called Adjust Mode in uh, X4. Um, so that's what you what you see here. But we basically have um, both a little histogram and, and information about your shot up here. We also have some con some very simple controls. In this case, I can I can basically take my little straightener and I can uh, straighten this little guy up. Uh, pretty quickly and I can take my crop tool and I can go in and uh, crop this guy uh, pretty quickly so let me just uh, go to free form and basically picking a, a size if you're going to go to print is what you want to do if you're just going to go to web or Facebook you can just go ahead and just uh, do a free form crop um, and you can you can see now I have have this uh, this thing cleaned up just just that quickly um, 
just as a little hint here, this uh, sign, I was told that the Mandarin underneath it is actually saying uh, no pets uh, in this restaurant, uh, which brings me to a lot of questions about whether or not people really have elephants or pets and, you know, that, that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, that fairly, fairly fun little photo there. Um, so basically, um, let's uh, hop over here to this post uh, with, a, with a little bit of foliage growing on the top of it. Um, a simple examples of types of things that we can do here. I've just brought up Smart Photo Fix, and I'm going to let it suggest some settings. Makes a very beautiful um, adjustment here. Brings the brightness up. Hits the shadows just a little bit for me and highlights. Frankly, suggest settings may not work well all of the time. In certain cases, it does. If it doesn't, just hit the undo button up at the top of the screen, and and uh, and you're not you know it's not going to be any worse for trying. So give that a shot. Uh, in this particular case, I'm going to hit this with a little bit of what's called local tone mapping. I'm going to hit maybe about 10 on the local tone mapping, and it'll give it just a little bit of crispness, a little bit more definition, a little bit more depth. And you can see in just a couple of clicks here, I've taken the photo that was really pretty good. I was pretty happy with it, but now I've taken it to one more level. In fact, there's a whole spider web off the edge over here that I didn't actually notice until after I did this, this quick adjustment. So it just adds just a little bit more by doing that. Okay, speaking of spiders, um, this, uh, this is another example of, of basically hopping in with a smart photo fix. It may, in this case, go a little bit brighter than I want, so I went back off on that, but you can see exactly the type of change that that made. And then, um, you know, I've got the availability of, of, of a high-pass sharpen here as well. So I can take this and, and maybe run out 40 or so on that, and you can see it sharpens up the detail a little bit. Um, you know, again, the whole idea around adjust mode is simple, clean, quick fixes, quick changes, allows you to make, make, uh, make differences in your photos uh, quickly and uh, be able to just uh, hack through whatever it, whatever you might be looking to uh, to clean up in your photos, um, and and uh, and get on with uh, whatever whatever else. So, um, the it, we've had a couple of people who have thought about this as a a quick sort of maybe a starter mode. Like I I I don't wouldn't need to use that because I I use the full editor, but in this case it really does allow you to get a lot done very quickly. Um, and you can see I can bang through the photos with, uh, with, uh, with relative ease in this regard. So um, based on the amount of time it looks like we have left, I'm going to hop over and show some things in our, our main editor. Uh, let me make sure I didn't lose anything here. No, that should, that should be good. So I'm just going to uh, click on uh, the edit mode here and uh, switch into that. No, I'm not going to save that change. Um, and I'm going to change directories. So um, those of you from X3, you would notice that uh, this this whole organizer being on the bottom of the screen is is new in this particular uh, world, um, and uh, making that available throughout the uh, the overall product allows people to come into edit mode without having to go through manage or adjust if they don't want to do that, and uh, and makes it a lot more usable in that particular way. I'm just going to grab a photo here, and I'll just drag it up and uh, throw it on the uh, in, into the edit area. By the way, I can actually let this thing auto hide at the bottom if I don't want to actually have that space being used up at this point. Let me show you a couple of simple examples of touch up. Again, this is not about deep editing today as much as kind of doing some simple cleanup on your photos um, and just adding a little bit of uh, of, of of interest to them and maybe uh, giving a little bit of detail where where you want to have more detail in a photo. So in this particular case, I like this guy. I like the general color balance on it. He was just a little bit dark. So I've gone into the control, um, the curves tool. I've uh, hit contrast, and I'm making a little bit of an S on this, uh, this curve here just to bring out the green a little bit more, bring out his face a little bit more. And I find him to be very contemplative and very uh, very interesting look that he that he has there uh, all done with a couple of uh, couple of quick clicks let me actually hop over into a tool 
from Nick Software called Color Effects Pro 3.0. Uh, if you get the ultimate version of the product, you actually get this along with it for free. And uh, it gives you a few different tools, a lot of different tools that you can use in this plugin. Um, a couple of them that I think are particularly interesting is the paper toner. Um, allows you to choose uh, uh, basically a, a virtual paper that you're printing uh, the photo on so you can see different look and feel that that generates. It's fabulous. Uh, and there's another one called Tonal Contrast. And this one gives, uh, gives we, we, we have uh, local tone mapping that I've shown you. We've got also areas where we use Clarity and Clarify. Uh, but this is just another flavor of that. And, you, and, and while I, I generally don't do a lot of tone mapping with people, uh, I think it really, with him, brings out just a, a little bit more character, a little bit more detail in the face, and a little bit more feel to this whole scene. And I think, um, you know, really, really completes, the, completes that very nicely. So let's see. Um, Again, any tool that you've got available in this just adjust mode, you've got the same tool available in the, the full editor and more. So again, we've got curves available to us. Um, I can uh, basically hop in and, and adjust, uh, adjust as I want to with this particular uh, column. I can also hit it with the, uh, with the local tone mapping um, if I want to do that and you can see what that looks like on the background. Yeah, that looks cool. Um, and then I can also uh, use other tools as well, like uh, things like Vibrancy, which is under the, the hue and saturation uh, area. So I can uh, bring out a little bit more of the color uh, in, uh, in the rock and so on. So a lot, of, a lot about getting the, getting the colors to pop uh, and, uh, in a photo. Uh, just a little bit of post-processing can make that really come through very nicely. Uh, let me find a couple of other things. Uh, again, just while looking at the amount of time we have, I want to be able to get a couple of questions at the end here. So let me just hop over and show um, uh, a couple of, uh, couple of things that will be uh, interesting here. So this is uh, Muir Lake, which is uh, in Yosemite, a uh, famous uh, area. A lot of Ansel Adams shots come from that particular area. Uh, in this particular case, if I uh, go into brightness and contrast area and I go to the fill light and clarity tool, uh, we can see actually how, how big of a difference we can make very quickly here. I'm just going to hit this with a little bit of fill light and it's going to fill in the, the dark area down here. And you can see the pop in the background here is coming from this thing called clarity. So it's a, it's a form of local tone mapping, but it's really very, very fine uh, for this type of scene. Uh, the other, the other thing that I'll say about um, uh, uh, about this sort of thing is that we've also got a number of effects which are fabulous for kind of finishing these off. The time machine is a uh, is an example of that, and if I can uh, hop in and use uh, like the platinum effect for this, um, this photo goes from being kind of a cool photo, kind of okay really nice in the color form and really spectacular in the black and white form. It gets right up there to Ansel Adams quality uh, look and feel to it. Um, so I think the last thing I want to show in, uh, in this area, again, just a number of different ways of straightening and cropping and, and, and doing other things. The last thing I wanted to show in, uh, in this area is, is a, a probably a little known or a little understood uh, detail, uh, and that is dealing with capture and apply. So if I take a, uh, a bird, and uh, I may have already touched this guy, but I'll, I'll show a simple example of something I, I might be able to do here. So if I apply a curve to, to this guy and I, and I make, some, make some change to what it looks like, not saying I'm, I want to make it dark like that, but if I do that, if I leave um, the editor, hop back over to manage for just a moment here, I'll actually see on that uh, bird, and I can't see it very well. Oops, I actually didn't save it. Um, let me uh, we'll go do that again. Uh, if, I, if I actually save an edit to, uh, to something uh, and 
and I go back over to manage, I will actually see that there's a little a pencil next to it saying that this has been edited. And okay, I've now saved that. I quit that better manage. I see those little pencils sitting there. If I go over here and say capture that editing and then I select the rest of these birds and apply that editing, it's going to basically take anything that I have done to that one photo and it's going to do it to each out each one of these photos in turn. Very quick, simple to the point batch processing simple to do, um, great for time-lapse work if you've got a lot of photos that you need to clean up, uh, touch in some simple way. Uh, I've used this on uh, literally making change to one photo, uh, capture the change and apply the same changes, multiple changes to 5,000 photos at a time. Now you've got to wait for that, but it, but it is something that, uh, that makes a, that sort of batch apply very, very easy. So um, in the future, doing some things with, with other uh, types of work, just to whet your appetite for some things going forward, uh, we've got a, a, an HD presentation coming up in a, in a few weeks, uh, something that you can sign up for on uh, a webinar on that. Examples of HDR, there are a lot of them around, um, and uh, it's a fabulous way to, to work. I, I happen to like that a lot. We've also got um, a number of other tools that, that are built in that you can you can play with um, you're directly in the software, stuff like the Photo Blender. I have not had a chance to show you that today, but uh, being able to take multiple photos of different form and be able to come up with uh, wacky and crazy or the perfect group shot is always a good thing to do. And then, of course, uh, other topics that we might get into, but on time-lapse photography might also be high-speed photography, that sort of thing sometime in the future. So let me hop back over to these slides for a moment here and zip down to other areas of study. Um, so in the, in the future, uh, you know, now that you have, uh, have a good feel for the relationship between these factors and uh, some of the